welcome to Getting Serious About Leisure, this fantastic podcast about making time for leisure activities and why it's important. This is episode three. I'm Kat Branch and I lead the Centre for Music here at UWE Bristol, which is the home of all extracurricular music making at UWE Bristol. And we're also joined by Dr Sam Elkington, co-author of The Serious Leisure Perspective, uh, which he co-wrote with Bob Stebbins. And he's a principal lecturer at Teesside University and our resident expert. And today I'm delighted to welcome our wonderful host, Dr Petia Petrova who in her day life is Associate Director of Academic Practice. And today we've managed to strong arm her into being our guest. So we're going to be hearing some really interesting perspectives about her experiences outside of that huge job. And I'd also like to welcome Judith Ritchie, who is the Faculty Director of Quality Enhancement and Standards for the Architecture and the Built Environment Faculty, which here at UWE we like to abbreviate to FET. I would like a prize for managing to get through those massive job descriptions without tripping or saying words wrong. So today we're going to be looking at the themes of silliness and the experience of freedom and joy that can be found in doing something creative just for its own sake and something that actually some might even consider ridiculous. So it should be lots of fun today. <laughs> so I'd like to start off by asking Judith and Petia to tell us a little bit about these types of activities that they have in their lives, sometimes quite hidden, I expect, and may not often be talked about. So let's hear a little bit about these kinds of activities that feel a bit silly and, and not necessarily about excellence and achievement, but just for their own sake. Petty, would you like to start us off? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about my, um, until recently, secret serious leisure improvised theatre. Um, the official definition, if I am correct, uh, of improvised theatre is collaborative storytelling. My own definition, particularly in the beginning of this journey, I've been now doing improvised theatre for about two years, um, was playtime for adults. Um, and that's very much what it is. You are with a bunch of adults making up stories and playing pretend and being fun and ridiculous and hopefully getting a few laughs. And that's improvised theatre in a nutshell. I love it. Playtime for adults. Sounds great. <laughs> Sounds like it could be something else. Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, Judith, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you're fitting into your leisure time? So mine starts off pretty seriously, really, in the sense that I, um, as a child, I used to play the clarinet. And then as an adult, I do dabbled with it. And then suddenly decided about, I don't know, five or six years ago that I might have a go at saxophone. So, so far, so good. But I play I play the saxophone in two very different outlets. One um, is a, an all-women swing band, uh, which is very much in my comfort zone. I sit there in front of music and I play and really like the sound that we make. The other one is in a band called the Ambling Band, which is a shambling, ambling thing, um, which um, is all about playing outside, playing for events, playing on marches, and as we'll probably discover later, most importantly, about um, looking ridiculous and making people happy. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Um, Sam, I'd, I'd like to bring you in, even at this very beginning bit, if we can, because I'm very interested in the way that we might apply a couple of Stebbins' archetypes to the, the descriptions we've heard there from Judith and Petia. Um, thinking about the kind of the amateur archetype, which has that sort of semi-professional aspiration, which sounds a bit like the swing work that Judith is doing. Mm. And then comparing that maybe to that hobbyist archetype, you know, the enjoyment only archetype, which might fit uh, or might provide a helpful insight into what Petia has described and the ambling band that Judith is talking about. Um, would you like to give us a couple of reflections there? Yeah, some really, really interesting experience. I mean, Ju Judith particularly there, you've, actually got, you've got two arcs in a way, haven't you, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the idea of play is an interesting one. It's not an explicit part of the serious leisure framework. Um, it probably best sits... Um, with the idea of casual leisure, you know, in terms of it being, you know, quote unquote, less serious. Uh, but actually what we're, what we're talking about here, I think, is more the nature of the activity in terms of how people approach the activity, the core activity, um, and also their motivation for being there. So 
the amateur arc, as you said, the archetype uh, musician that Judith clearly is, um, will have started out very seriously or will have emerged to become a, a serious activity. Um, but I wonder, Judith, I, I wanted to ask you a question in terms of the play element, because this is something I think probably needs to be teased out even more in the serious leisure framework, is the, is, the, is the role of play. And, you know, Bob's written a little bit about this. I mean, I've never touched on it, really. But play is a component part. And it's probably, like I say, more naturally aligned to the idea of the more casual uh, component of the framework. But I wonder what role the play element in the doing of the core activity plays for you. Yes, well, I was asked to, to talk about what I did, you know, inevitably it led me to think about the motivations and the, and the role of these two things. So they're essentially the same. They're playing the saxophone. Um, actually, they're doing, for me, two completely different things. Mm. And um, if we're reflecting on the, the the reasons why we do things and the impact on our lives, which, um, then they they perform totally different functions. So for the Sisters of Swing, perhaps that does fit in a little bit more into into what you're talking about, the um, serious leisure. Not that not that I'm ever going to go any higher with it, but it does push me further. Uh, I, I have to do things that are a bit more complicated than I would normally musically. Mm. Um, and I have to reach a reasonable standard because, you know, we perform in front of people. It is only very much an amateur group, but nevertheless, you know, the standards are reasonably high. And there are people in there who are much better than me. So that's that's a really good way, isn't it, when mm. you're in an ensemble of, of you pushing yourself up. Mm. The ambling band is a totally different thing and actually performs a totally different function in my life. So what it enables me to do is become completely different, completely other from how I'm normally expected to be. And it allows me to explore aspects of myself which perhaps are not demonstrated in my life roles. So, you know, we all have life roles. So I have a work-life role, which is very serious, as you can probably gather from the, the title. Um, <clears throat> and, and sometimes that, that is at odds with my personality, I think. And the same then goes perhaps for other roles. You know, I, I'm a mother. You now have to gasp when I say I'm also a grandmother. You don't gasp. <gasps> I'm out of here now. Thank you. Um, that's excellent, Kat. Thank you very much. Never. Um, thank you, Stab. <laughs> Even better. Marvellous. Um, so, uh, yeah, so all these, you know, all these roles make, you know, they, they all have lots of serious aspects to them, don't they? We have to be mm. sensible. And I was a, um, the eldest of three children. So my entire childhood was about being sensible, about looking after the others, about giving an example. And so for me, being in the ambling band where I can go into the middle of Bristol in a pink tutu and a sparkly top, uh, silver leggings and charge around the precinct, um, making people dance to this music is great. I love that. I absolutely love that. So, uh, I mean, in that we're hearing, you know, the, the, the importance of role identities there. Yeah. And how even, you know, the different facets of even that core activity i.e the playing of the saxophone for example or making music that you know there are different roles and different identities at play in that for you which is really interesting petty what about yourself then in terms of the role of play what, what do you think well when i started doing improv i had decided that my life and i am extremely boring i needed a shake-up uh, and i was very much like judith taking my work very seriously and taking life very seriously. And I, I needed a shake up. So improv was, I mean, I stumbled onto it, but it was deliberate in that respect that I was searching for something that is outside of me and very different to me and would just allow me to be different. And like Judith said, allow me to be playful um, and to be cheeky and to be ridiculous or and to be murderous <laughs> or whatever it is that happens in a particular scene um, and not to be consciously having that kind of careful approach that you would take to meetings and your professional mm -hmm. life um, or um, even that kind of responsible persona that I had in relation to how my friends saw me. I was deliberately looking for something out there. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. I mean, I would say as well, I mean, it's, it's, it takes a certain level of courage as well to seek out opportunities like that. So 
um, you know, the intentionality in that is quite interesting. And, and Judith, you know, there's intentionality to what you do. You're seeking out other opportunities. But the, the key thing for me here is, you know, the playful, it's the expression. So the playful expression of different role identities that perhaps, you know, fulfill or more fulfilling than perhaps the day, you know, and it's that separate and escape that you have. Yes, I was just, um, I was very interested that Petia commented that she sort of stumbled into yeah. improv theatre. And um, and I was interested in the contrast between Petia and Judith's enormous jobs and these kind of hilarious um, and kind of, um, some might say, frivolous activities that are providing this separate space. I was very interested to know how both of you got into these activities so obviously Petty you've given us a sense of your intention but I would love to know how you've actually got started onto something so different and radical as improv theatre if you'd like to tell us about that. So after my decision that life needed a shake up and a little bit of refresh um, there was a leadership conference at UWE and there was a guest speaker um, who was talking about leadership development and using performing arts as tools for leadership development. And I went to that workshop and I had a lot of fun. Um, and, and that's really um, then tuned me onto the idea of improv theater, which I've never heard of. I, I had no idea what it is. Um, I have no kind of artistic or creative background in, in my past. That's not really, I haven't been in the school's theater production. And, and then I just Googled around for things to do. Um, I kind of, um, in deciding my life needed to refresh, I, I set myself a challenge, which started two weeks after that particular, um, you know, chance uh, workshop to do 43 things in 43 days that I knew, even if it was, you know, drinking tequila for the first time, just small things. <laughs> I, was just try, I was just trying to get myself to experience new things and, and get, get out there. And one of the things I identified was... Um, and a, a drop-in workshop at the Improv Theatre, um, which uh, some, some mentioned courage. I decided to go to that, and I was about to turn around and come back at the door, and I called my partner, and he talked me into actually walking through the door. And I don't think if I didn't have that conversation, I'm not sure I would be here talking to you about Improv Theatre, because I didn't, I was very close to just not letting, you know, giving it a go. But that's the some of the story about how I ended up doing um, improv. Amazing. Thanks, Fetia. Um, Judith, could you tell us a little bit about your experience as well and how you got into Ambling Band in particular? Because as a sax player, to go into um, a jazz, an amateur jazz ensemble, I think we can imagine that journey quite easily. But I'm trying to imagine you now in your fantastic tutu and leggings combo and just <laughs> so I'd love to know how you started doing that. Well, the uh, the tutu of the leggings is not the hard part. The hard part for me actually was the the saxophone playing. So I'm not a I'm not a particularly good saxophone player. I'm certainly not someone who plays by ear, um, and I resisted being in this band for probably about twenty two years. I would say something like that. Um, <laughs> so uh, my husband has been part of this band for all that time. And while our children were small, that was his thing, and and I did other things, um, and so that was always his. That was his. That's his. Now, obviously, once our children have grown up, um, somehow there was less less reason. Particularly once I started playing the saxophone, which I only did, obviously, as I said, more recently. Uh, previously, it was the clarinet. But the clarinet, I could hide behind that because that didn't really work very well for the Abbey Band because it doesn't sound out that much. Um, but they, there was a lot of pressure for me to be part of it. And I really didn't want to do it because um, they they don't, it's not a jazz, it's honestly, it's very, very basic music. It's umpa music, it's street street music. Um, but, but we don't have music and I can't play by ear. So the, the terror of playing, even though... It's a shambles, even though nobody expects the Ambling Band to sound amazing in terms of music, because what they're doing is they're creating an atmosphere, they're creating a happening, they're making people part of something. That's much more of what it's about. However, you are still meant to play notes in the right order. <laughs> um, and, and that, for me, was absolutely terrifying, and it still is terrifying, because... 
I, I, I feel much happier putting my saxophone down and rushing into the crowd and pulling out some hapless person who were jiggling their shoulders. And I knew that they had an inner dance waiting to come out. And I love bringing that out. But actually, you know, playing the saxophone is really pushing it for me, really make it that's very hard. Even though, honestly, as musicians, you would laugh if you saw what I had to do. There's not many notes there. But still, that's really scary because I, you know, I find that hard. I can't just hear it and play it. Do you find that kind of constant element of risk part of the benefit that you take from the activity? Or is that a challenge that you're willing to face because the other aspects, the other kind of joyful participation aspects are worth it for the struggle of being in your discomfort <laughs> zone with the saxophone? No, I think um, I think both of the activities that I'm in offer that discomfort in different ways. So with the Sisters of Swing, it's because the actual music is a bit more com is more complicated and there are bits that you know you're not that good at and you need to practice in order to be good. And I like that because otherwise I would never practice. I don't have inner motivation to do it. So I have to have that kind of jeopardy of knowing that I'm going to go to a rehearsal on a Monday and, you know, other people are going to look at me and think, well, hang on, haven't, haven't, haven't you got that bit yet? Can't you play that bit? I don't want that to happen, so I will practice to make sure that doesn't mm -hmm. happen. So I think they both have that element of jeopardy. It's just it's just for different reasons. And do you think, Judith, that, that jeopardy element gives you, gives you something good, though? <laughs> um, no, it does give you something good as an outcome. I think it's probably, you know, it's kind of akin to, I guess, when people climb, climb rocks and do kind of scary things like that. I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't understand why putting an instrument to your mouth when you're not very good at it is kind of scary, but I guess it's sort of similar. It's interesting. And at Petia, in other conversations that we've had, um, we've talked a bit about the kind of the risk factor involved in improv, but also in some ways um, the unique situation that improv theatre creates where you can try things and actually it doesn't necessarily have to work and that that can be very freeing. Could, could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, so one of the key things that, um, particularly in Bristol Improv Theatre, we are taught is the idea of happy fail. <laughs> so um, that we embrace trying things out and it's not working out. Um, and that you just find enjoyment in the activity. And if it works out and it comes up with a fabulous story or everybody in the audience is laughing, that's great. And if it doesn't work out, that's great. You're just having fun whilst you're doing it. Um, and that's something that doesn't come easy to me and doesn't come easy to, to my peers who are doing improv. But it's, it's actually when you find that kind of sweet spot of just saying, I'll just give it a go and I enjoy giving it a go. And if it works, fabulous. If it doesn't work, great. <laughs> so with the, the important thing is we're, we're together in, in this, this moment. And I think that's, um, uh, what's, what's quite interesting. The, um, idea of, of risk is also, um, interesting because any improvised scene is a risk or more often than not you go in with nothing or maybe with a suggested word and you just have to create something out of nothing with another person or with other people um, and you never know how it's going to turn out um, and I'm quite a kind of nervous person I always have nerves before teaching doesn't matter how long I've been doing it or how you know how, how comfortable I'm, I'm doing it I will always get a bit of stage, stage fright kind of stuff. It's interesting I don't get that, or at least until now. It's been a year since I've been in a 3D theatre. Um, but there is that kind of mindful focus in that moment that it doesn't, you have to be really in the moment with the other person to do the improvised theatre. So you have to park all your critical voices and all your nerves and everything else. So there's that mindful exclusion that's really... Um, helpful. Judith? I was just picking up, Petty, on what you were saying um, about creating things with other people. And I think that's probably another aspect, perhaps for both of us, I don't want to speak on your behalf, and you can pick me up if I got, haven't got this, but um, I'm thinking that both of us have got job roles that, although we are always working with other people, we are expected to lead and there are a lot of things that we do where we're quite exposed and and doing things quite, you know, independently and on, on our own. Um, 
part of the joy of these activities is the fact that they're nothing to do with me as an individual at all. It's all about working with the group because with the Sisters of Swing, you know, if you were to cut everybody else out and just have my part, you, half the time you wouldn't even know what tune was being played. Um, so because of being a tenor, you know, second tenor saxophone, you're just sort of filling in. Um, with the ambling band, um, the ambling band is nothing if it's not a group. And actually it's nothing if it's not the audience as well. And maybe that's also something for you as well, Petya. That's really interesting. So one of the key things that we are taught, and particularly when we had student showcases, is uh, there's this ritual just before we go on stage where you have to go around the group and kind of tap each other's on the shoulder pre-COVID time and say, I've got your back. And the idea is that you've got everybody's back. So if you see that, you, first of all, this is a collaborative endeavor, but if you see that your peer is... Um, you know, he's just um, not sure what they're doing, that you you kind of support and, and you get them out of it. <laughs> um, um, or if they've come up with, with an idea that they're not sure about and you're not sure about, you just go with it and you build on it and create something from it. But but it's, it's absolutely, you're, you're never on your on your own because it's collaborative. And I really like that little bit of I've got your back pre-performance ritual that we're engaged with because it, it just calms everybody um, and it gets them out from focusing on, oh my God, how am I going to perform to actually I'm doing this with everybody else. I was struck as well by both of your descriptions of that I've got your back kind of culture setting activity that you do together and um, and Judith, the way you described the Ambling Band in particular and that actually those those activities give a space for you to have a break from having to lead from the front, from having to have the structure, from having to set the tone, that actually you can put all that aside. And that in a way, these leisure spaces are giving you this, this place to be other, to be something else. Not necessarily some a, a person who you are not, but in fact, a break from all the other roles that you have to occupy. I wondered, I'd wonder if I could bring Sam back in, if there are um, some insights there into the ways in which leisure gives us a gives us a break, gives us a chance to kind of shrug off um, the shackles of what the rest of our lives require from us in terms of you know responsibilities and um, serious adulting. Um, could you give us some insights there? I don't know if my adulting's ever been serious, but yeah, no, I think the uh, there's some really interesting observations here. I mean, the, the thing that a couple of things that jump out at me. I mean, just to go back to the conversation we had uh, around risk, and, and you've got you've got two aspects of risk here, and I think this this does come through in the framework when we start talking about things like challenge, and but also so you've got the first aspect of the risk is is hook, and I thought. Um, Judith's comparison to rock climbers, well, I thought was was really really quite interesting. There's quite there's quite a bit of work done in serious leisure around bouldering and 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 mountaineering. And Bob's written a whole book about mountaineering and serious leisure. Um, and risk is a factor, and it's and it's it's part of the hook. So the hook that draws you in, you know. So, but also the, with an identity then attached to that. So you know, being identified as a bit of a risk taker. You know, and that's then hooked into this broader social world. But then you've got the other side of risk as well, which is overcoming something. So it's part of the challenge, part of the doing of the core activity itself, and therefore attached to certain skills and abilities. So and developing a certain level of competence somewhere. So, you know, whilst we're saying this is all, you know, very frivolous and, you know, silly and, and playful and non-serious, ironically, um, there is an element that it's still very much a, 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 an intentional piece of work. And um, I've, I've got two more things to say, but the, the next thing to say in terms of observations was what I'm hearing is just on that, being able to disconnect or escape or be other in terms of space, that unique social world of each of the activities that we're hearing about is 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 absolutely crystal clear, isn't it? You know, you can, you can hear in how both Judith and Betty are describing the experiences of being part of this group or uh, part of this uh, ensemble or sh uh, shambles. Yeah, I think sh I, I'm going to use that word a lot more in my day-to-day -day life, I think, because that covers, covers everything for me. 
But it is, it's really interesting because within that, and, and Kat used the word culture, and this is really, so there's, there's typically within serious leisure and serious leisure social world, they are unique. They're unique on the basis they have a, a subcultural component to them, a set of norms and beliefs which are entirely different to the day job. Yeah, and it's something that perhaps aligns more with who you truly see yourself as, as a, an authentic representation of who you see yourself as, which goes back to Julie's original point, you know, yeah, it's maybe I, it's more of me in this than perhaps my day job, which I thought was really interesting. My final point um, is behind all of this is the sense that we are doing this just for the sake of doing it. Yeah, in terms of motivation, you know, we're not doing it to become expert. We're not doing it necessarily to uh, derive, you know, very clear, specific benefits to ourselves or others. And the the idea that comes out there is this idea of um, that these activities are autotelic. This is the word that's used um, in the framework and elsewhere as well. And it, it literally translates as to self goal. So the activity, the doing of the activity itself in that social world is enough. That's all that, you know, and that's that playful component. I'm not here to better myself or others. I'm not here to be the best um, player in the group. I'm simply here because the doing of the activity gives me something I can't get anywhere else. So that autotelitism, I think, is is crystal clear in both. And so just to bring just bring that word to the table, so, you know, that is written about and and we do have evidence of that in rock climbing, in amateur acting, sport, you know, quilting, believe it or not. You know, there's all different kinds of uh, represent. You can see how that plays out, you know, and everybody has a similar autotelic quality, but it's lived out differently depending on the on the activity. So just some general observations there, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, that's really helpful language, Sam. Um, and um, it really, really helps us understand um, the serious leisure discourse in a little in a little bit more nuance, actually. So thank you so much for that. I wondered on that um, introducing the autotelic element, um, if Petia and Judith, you were asked to articulate, you know, what's the what's the point? What's the point of what you're doing? <laughs> what, what would you say? Well, as you were talking there, Sam, I was thinking about um, one of the other aspects certainly of the activities that I do and, and it probably would be the same for Petia over time is where these things can take you so they take you to places um, on a on a micro level so that is you know the actual experience that you're talking about you know why do you do it well you do it because it's fun you do it because Certainly, uh, well, probably in both cases, both of my examples, but particularly with the ambling band, um, the great thing about playing in the ambling band is the impact that it has on the space around them. Um, and so quite literally, uh, so you have where it takes you in terms of the, the, the moment you're in and the impact that you have on the people around you, um, which is always exhilarating. But then also, literally, these things take you to other places. So, um, you know, when we could travel um, last year or the year before last, was it now probably? Um, you know, we went to to Ireland to a, a festival in Ireland. Now, that that was really interesting because we were at a music festival, a little tiny music festival, a place called Clodakilty, which is quite famous for having really good musicians in it. There were there was a band competition going on of which we were not a part because it was clearly accepted that you know we weren't at that level. But what was really interesting was that the bars kind of sort of moved people out of the way so we would we could come in, even though our musicianship was way below the musicianship of other people who were there. It was because of the atmosphere that we created and the the fun that was engendered and the silliness that was allowed in the people that were part, you know, were sort of around us. Um, so that literally, for me, that literally going to other places and being in different places, that's another thing that it that it does bring and another reason for doing it. It's so interesting that there was such a response then of the public to the kind of silliness sphere that Ambling Band was obviously carrying with it. So if audience was then in the orbit of Ambling Band, then 
all bets were off and you could well, start to be I much mean, more ridiculous. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, well, I couldn't quite believe it. There were a couple of people who came up and they just missed us playing outside one pub. And they were, oh, no, we just missed you. We said, oh, well, we're, we're playing, you know, at two o'clock at blah, blah, blah. And, and these two people said, oh, we'll close our shops and um, at that point, and we'll come up and see you. I was thinking, what? <laughs> <laughs> I think that shows you the huge thirst that we've all got for uh, some less serious less serious spaces in our lives <laughs> and an excuse and permissions to, you know, to behave in ways that are normally deemed socially ludicrous. I don't know whether you relate to that, Petia, and whether perhaps in that context you could tell us a bit about how you would answer, you know, what's the point of what you're doing with your improv? So it's interesting. <laughs> the point is clearly to have fun. Um, the, the interesting thing is that it evolves. So, as I said, I've been doing this now two years. Um, and it started with the point is to have fun, like you, by you yourself doing it in the moment. I was uh, reflecting as I was listening to Judith. Then it kind of evolved because everybody else comes up with such glorious, wonderful ideas. So whether you're in a scene with them or whether you're watching them being in a scene with somebody else, that it's just so much fun to watch. <laughs> so 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 that's all wrapped around that. There is the point, however, that once you've done one or two student showcases and you've heard 50 or 60 people laughing at the joke um, or at what you're creating and kind of create that audience mm -hmm. fun, then you get that addictive aspect of it. Then you want to have fun, but you also want to have fun with a big audience having fun with you. Um, so, so there's a little bit of an evolution of where where it started and where it's going in terms of what's the, the point of it all. There's a really interesting parallel here. Um, actually, the book going way back now to the 70s. Um, if you ever have an opportunity to hear Bob speak or, or ask him a question, ask him about this. Um, you know, one of his first books was um, called The Laugh Makers. And actually, it was all about amateur comedians. And it's what sparked the whole thing. It was it was this. It's really interesting. You know, I'm coming full circle now to what kind of the genesis of the whole idea of Serious Leisure was. What what made what was so unique about this environment? Um, you know, and it was exactly it was that shared aspect with an audience, with a you know, and being able to then express parts of yourself that honestly hadn't been allowed to be expressed because of what certain constraints in non-leisure settings you know so it's really interesting just to draw some parallels here you know in terms of the language you're using and the experiences you're describing you know that the book the laugh makers in one of the first books that Bob wrote around the idea of leisure although he didn't know it at the time um that this this really came through so um yeah it's, it's a fundamental component to the idea of serious leisure that's fascinating, Sam. How interesting. I, did, I didn't realise at all that kind of stand-up. Well, he has written comedy. like 67 books, so he's very <laughs> sometimes to remember. But it's it's the story that, it's it's the story in terms of its genesis, the idea of serious leisure. You know, Bob didn't set out to write about leisure. It wasn't, a th he was a, he's a sociologist. He was more interested in the kind of the, the social composition of that particular environment, the dynamics and everything else. And it emerged as being, well, there's something here and it's not work for them. It's something else, you know, and they're play so the idea of play. Um, so I, I just find it fascinating just on a personal level that, um, you know, you're you're drawing such parallels with that early work. I would at this uh, juncture like to comment that Judith is now wearing the most spectacular pink fluffy cardigan. So for those of you listening... It's, uh, for those of you who are listening on the podcast, you should now be experiencing great envy of this fan fabulous pink garment and also sadness that you're not getting to visually enjoy it as we are. Um, at this juncture, I'm going to ask uh, our lovely audience if they have any particular insights or comments or questions. You guys have been ever so quiet and British on the chat. So hopefully that's because our discussion has been so gripping that you weren't able to um, uh, pop anything in there for us. But we'd really love to hear from you now. Um, could you please uh, put us something in the chat if you'd like to speak and then you can turn on your audio and video and we can schedule that in nicely without a load of crackling and dead air. Otherwise, just pop something there in the chat and I will uh, relay that to our guests. 
So I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to, to think about that. And while you're formulating any questions and comments, and indeed, we'd love to hear your own stories if you relate to anything that Petty and Judith have been talking about today in terms of finding that space to be silly, um, that sort of free space where a kind of playfulness and joy can emerge. Um, we'd really love to hear about that as well. Um, so while you're thinking about that, um, I'm going to ask Petty and Judith uh, just to comment a bit on um, on the role of creativity, actually, in their choices of leisure. Because this this is a hot topic for me. Petty is laughing. You can't hear her because she's on mute, but she's chuckling because um, as somebody who leads a music service, I encounter a huge range of individual opinions on this particular area, as you can imagine, from, oh, yes, I'm a very, very creative person. So three people who feel that way. Wonderful. And but most people I meet and especially colleagues, as this is a podcast directed at staff, I have to say, swing the other way towards uh, a giant kind of I'm here, but I'm here, but uh, I'm not really a creative person or my all time favorite. I'm not really a musical person. Um, the kinds of activities Judith and Petty have been talking about clearly require a, a, a kind of automatic and immediate instantaneous creative response to the situation. Um, so I would really love just to hear from Judith and Petty a little bit about um, how the role of creativity in, in the enjoyment of that activity and how that relates to these themes of identity and potentially otherness. Um, Petty, would you like to kick us off on that? And please, in the meantime, uh, our guests, please do put in the chat your comments and questions uh, while we're discussing this next section so that we've got time to slot them in as we run into the final segment of our podcast together. Thank you. So I was about giggling through the entire question, Kat, because I know I don't see myself as a creative person. And I mean, I, I used the word to describe myself early in this conversation as boring, and I kind of still do, although that's obviously evolving. And I'm very aware that I'm involved in a very creative activity. <laughs> the entire point of the improvised theater is to create something in the moment, but I don't have that self-identity. I'm not necessarily sure if we kind of going to go down that route as well, but in terms of identities and kind of my professional identity and my improv identity or even my self-identity somewhere in between that, in the first year I was doing improv, I would not mention that I'm doing improv anywhere in my professional context. That, that would be almost like my secret hobby. Um, and I would also um, not mention anything at all in terms of what I do for a living in the improv theater environment. Um, to the point where at some stage my uh, my peers started laughing that I must be a spy because every time they asked me what I do, I would just do some evasive maneuver and not answer the question or move on the conversation. So so they all kind of queued, queued on to that. But, but I was so determined that I will create this separate identity and I will not let the other one seep into it. Um, that I was very determined at that stage. And then said, until recently, my two worlds started colliding with this podcast, but also some um, kind of research and conferences I've been to where people have been talking about improvised theater and education, um, where the <laughs> things are starting to, to merge, um, regardless of my best efforts at the beginning. <laughs> I'm so interested in the amount of effort you must have put in there, Petty, to keep these two separate places. Almost yeah. as if you could occupy two completely different people. I'm fascinated to know why you were motivated to take that approach. What were you thinking? <laughs> what was I thinking? I mean, I... to say, what were you thinking about? As opposed, what were you thinking? That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was very determined that I'll carve out space that's separate from work. At the very beginning, I was at the point where I would work long hours. And even if I wasn't working, I would be obsessing about work and I would be thinking about work and, uh, or I would be checking emails on holidays. And, and I just, and, and also education is the kind of field where if you start, if you mention what you do, people start commenting about, you know, higher education or purpose of higher education. And then you end up monopolizing the conversation with your day job. And I just wanted to be not to kind of carve out space where my day job had no influence on. Um, and, and, and that was a very particular reason for the point in time where I was at, where I wanted to put my work that's taken over my life into a work box that doesn't fill up the entirety of my life. So in a way, it was a kind of boundary drawing. 
exercise yeah, absolutely. And, and a way of um, of protecting that freedom space that you'd opened up for yourself and yes. hence that hard line. Yes, and I could be ridiculous and I could be silly and I didn't have to have my professional identity in that space because that stops me from doing so. Mm, okay, right, yeah, fascinating, Petia. Rachel has just put into the chat um, about uh, an idea that as the standard of whatever the activity is increases, that somehow playfulness diminishes. Um, do we of you relate to that and have some response to that? Has that been true in your experience or, or maybe not, actually? Um, Judith, with your two different music activities, you might have some interesting perspectives um, on that question that Rachel has raised. Would you like to come in on that? Yeah, that is a really interesting question. And as I read it, I thought, oh, do I think that? Um, I think probably, probably not. And I think maybe maybe it depends on your ability. So so if I would imagine, I have to imagine this because um, I am not this person, but I would imagine if you were an amazing saxophone player and you therefore play to a very high standard, that you would have a huge amount of fun doing that. So I don't think I could, you know, because I always look the thing, I always say if I was ever, if I was ever reinvented, if I could be reincarnated and I could be given, and I'm afraid I'm very greedy, I want two, if I could be given two kind of superpowers, those two superpowers would be one to be able to make people laugh and the other one would be to be able to play an instrument as though it was a part of my body do you know what i mean by that i you know when you, you mean you by watch that. People... i want that super <laughs> <laughs> you know if you watch somebody that really can play can just play their instrument it's like it's an extension of their their being isn't it it's like they they don't have to think about it they just drip the music through the instrument whatever the instrument is so i would imagine if you're that person the standard would be incredible but you would have a lot of lot of play so i think maybe i possibly muddied that water by by kind of separating out the, the two things the the, um, the ambling band and the sisters of swing uh, because for me personally, the system, they offer different challenges. So the Sisters of Swing offers the challenge of making myself play to a higher standard. Um, and I get loads of pleasure from that. And the other one um, gives me the challenge of playing without music, which is a challenge. And I don't find having fun a challenge, actually. That's quite easy. Um, but uh, the musical part is more of a challenge. Mm, that's, so that's I don't know if that's really addressed that. I think I think it's interesting that um, some of the effort we have to put in on the journey of improving our standards uh, may may not always have a playful yeah. quality. Just speaking from my own experience as a musician, now, <laughs> not yeah, always a playful exactly. quality to all the drills I do on on the piano where I feel most free. My my longest training was on the French horn, and interestingly, it is now the instrument I play least because. The amount of effort I had to put in to reach the standards that I reached in my prime on that instrument was so overwhelming um, and overbearing. Um, I did not find that a free place. And the work I had on the piano was much looser and lighter. And the piano was much more a place for me to build musical concepts, as it is for many people. And that is the place that I go to now. And as far as that notion of the instrument as an extension of the body i do experience that on the piano mm. um so uh, rachel said oh, you know how do we keep the learning journey playful and interestingly i feel and, I, and please do jump in that this can be a lot about context so i i still do crack out my french horn but most normally in a kind of comedy setting of demonstrating different musical principles as opposed to formal recitals um on the other hand with the piano, I love being able to improvise with other musicians and do kind of songwriting or even more formal composition. That to me still has a very playful quality. So I think there's something about doing the things that we want to do in different contexts that give us different benefits, a bit like do with what you're doing with your sax playing, actually. You know, you've got that kind of stretch and challenge zone, which you find satisfying in one way. And then you've got this kind of uh, fear-facing 
risk overcoming zone, which also has this hugely fun quality to it. And um, and that's working. And I, want, I wonder, Petty, if your experience with improv theatre might be quite different if, in fact, you then had to siphon that in as two as you're working, two of your working days and you were going to be doing gigs and stuff, whether that might somewhat shift your experience of it in terms of the benefits that it gives you, you know? My perspective is is a little bit different, yes, because I'm so early in the journey. Um, just reflecting on my experience and experience of people around me who are doing improv, there's actually a lot of skills that you need to develop. As our teachers talk about the kind of the toolkit, the, there's different tools and techniques that you kind of become part of your arsenal that you then pull, pull out of your pocket and apply in a moment. Um, and sometimes you can be taught something thousands of times and still not find it in the moment. So the learning journey is you can do something very early on that's totally hilarious and it clicks. But to have consistency requires a lot of um, a lot of learning. I think my reflections have been more about the burnout side of things. Um, so I've um I had some of my peers who really loved doing it, and um, there were different ways of getting engaged with the theater. There's the, the kind of the courses that have student showcases, and then there are also the, the kind of amateur opportunities. Um, and some of them were doing so much at one stage that where they almost felt um, it's addictive because of the, the kind of laughter and people having kind of fun with, with you. But it also leads to a point where you're just too tired. There's just too much um, improv as a result of that. I haven't yet reached that point because I think I'm relatively early on the journey. I've, I've only have student have had student showcases as as an, I've, you know I haven't done proper performances. We were meant to do a proper performance the week the first lockdown happened, so that's the end of my career. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, um, just a temporary COVID pause, Patty. Hopefully, um, so I haven't kind of reached that that point. Uh, all I would say is the the kind of the courses and the opportunities that the theatre provides is, is they're always so beautifully. I mean, from my professional perspective, they're so always so beautifully and gorgeously designed that as a learner, you have no cho- choice but to have fun. Um, and I think that's been very helpful. Uh, for for me but no I haven't reached the professional stage where this has stopped have being fun <laughs> well the, you'll have to keep us posted on that because it'll be interesting <laughs> to know how that journey goes and uh, and as Rachel pointed out how you keep that journey playful and how the playfulness stays obviously improv has to be playful whatever but in this case I mean that that sense of personal joy and playfulness um, Adam has made some interesting comments here in the chat and uh, he's observed that um, in terms of the labels that we carry and how people label us, it's very true. He observes that people often ask us what we do, first and foremost, our job, and that's our label. Um, and so we don't often get on to discuss where we take joy from outside of our work activities. And so, yes, so then people often are very surprised when they hear about our outside interests. I certainly was, Petty, when we first spoke and you were telling me about improv. I was absolutely fascinated and it completely blew my mind because it seemed very counterintuitive to your enormous job and your quite serious and academic persona. And I was just thrilled and delighted. Um, Judith, you want to come in on this one? I was just thinking... um... Actually, in my head, I was linking up those last two questions about keeping the learning journey playful and and the comments that Adam was making. I think to myself that maybe we should we should think a little bit more possibly about all of us bringing our kind of who we are um, into both our working lives and our and our learning lives. Although as I'm saying that, Petty, I'm thinking about what you said about you know wanting to keep it separate. So. It should never be. It should never be something that's forced on anybody. But we don't actually get those spaces, particularly, to do that, do we? Um, to to share who we really are. You know, we we plunge ourselves into meetings. We plunge ourselves into um, teaching sessions and learning sessions. And we have a, you know, we're, we're taught that we have to have a very clear view of exactly what it is we want to get out of it and why are we there and 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 there isn't. Perhaps we don't give that kind of expansive space for people to to share who they are. So maybe that's that's something that we need to think about with our students, um, those of us who are, are teaching, and perhaps with with colleagues. I'm I'm just remembering that I had a brief spell of two, two or three years of being a head of department, and actually 
um, the very first away day that we had, I did uh, get people to do that time-honoured thing, which I'm sure we've all done at various points, which is to put in a piece of paper in a box of something that they've done that would be surprising to other people. And then they, they all got read out and people had to guess who the person was. Um, and it was extraordinary the difference that that simple activity made to that away day. It was a totally different away day um, because I was bringing two departments together. So that was partly the reason for doing it. People didn't know them very well, didn't know each other very well. And it did it did impact on the whole of the way the day went. The time. Yes, because you've, you've got, that, like, got that honesty and disclosure and then you've got the meeting of authentic selves in a way. Um which, you know, our front, our, our work personas <laughs> only have a little bit, don't they? Um, we're almost out of time today. Uh, so I'm just going to very quickly um, squeeze in um, Lee Palmer's question where she has asked whether your um, different activities, Judith and Petia, were ones that you had an interest in as a child. Um, do you think that this kind of activity taps into the inner child? So dipping, dipping a toe into psychology here. Of course, we don't have a huge amount of time, so I'm going to have to ask you to respond to that with brevity, if you can. Who would like to go first? Petia. Um, I'll go first. Yes, although, as I said, it was something that I was interested in as a child, but either never encouraged or never had space to do as a child. Um, I was curious around performance as maybe six year old, but as I said, never never have actually done anything like that. And the playfulness in the inner child is is definitely um, coming into that. Lovely, Judith. And I would say, um, kind of yes, in the sense that I did play an instrument, but I don't think I played an instrument and I didn't use it in the way that I do now. I think where it links up to my inner child massively. So I think I said earlier, I always had to behave myself as a, as a child. And I think that I am actually essentially a naughty person inside a very good person. Um, so I'm a very silly person inside a very sensible person. And I have been all my life. So that silliness and that naughtiness has always been sort of suppressed, really. And so, yes, this does um, enable that to come out. Saves me doing something more naughty. So <laughs> <laughs> putting whoopee cushions around the staff room judith i know you've thought about it <laughs> <laughs> listening audience i'm nodding here vigorously uh, to what judith said about um having always to be serious and being a naughty person in a serious <laughs> car yes lovely so um helga has asked are these sessions going to continue and i'm delighted to say that we're looking forward to doing some more um, just before we wrap up today, I would like to uh, draw your attention to our special edition Feel Good February podcast on the Getting Serious About Leisure series. This will be on Friday, February the 5th, and we're going to be doing a special episode focusing on social prescribing, which is a sort of sidestep from our usual kind of discussion. But nevertheless, actually, the increasing popularity of social prescribing and its um, endorsement by the NHS and, um, and medics more generally shows actually that the idea of having um, time that is deliberately put aside for the kinds of leisure activities that nourish us and help us to connect with other people is finally being recognised in a more official capacity. So um, we have some social prescribing work going to be taking place here at UWE Bristol as well. So we'll be talking a bit about that project and just making some links between the serious leisure discourse and social prescribing as a model. So I think it's going to be fantastic. And for any of you who are thinking about, I really need to help justify to myself why I give myself permission to do the things that I love and the things that nourish me, this one will definitely help you as well. So uh, finally, um, you can see in the chat, there is another link to our permissions form if you haven't done that. Um, we would also really love to have your feedback on these sessions. Um, after this episode, we will send you a feedback form. Please do tell us what you thought, um, the aspects of uh, this episode and others that you might have listened to that you've really enjoyed, and perhaps any thoughts about things we can think about for the future that you'd like to hear discussed and guests we could approach. Um, if you yourself would like to come and appear as a guest, we'd love to talk to you and hear about your leisure experiences um, and, and, and what that means to you. And also, if there are areas that are currently untapped that you'd like to draw to our attention, we'd love to consider all of those insights. So please do give us your feedback because it's really important for us. 
otherwise that wraps us up for today so uh thank you first and foremost to our very special guest judith ritchie today for joining us i was absolutely fascinated to hear about her activities with sisters of swing and the ambling band in particular i hope to catch them in bristol um i'd also like to thank dr petia petrova for allowing us allowing sam and i to strong arm her into being a guest today uh really enjoyed hearing her fantastic insights and experiences about improv theater and of course i'd like to thank our um in-house expert dr sam elkington in-house to the leisure podcast uh dr elkington actually resides at teesside university but uh he's he's family in this setting so thank you so much sam for joining us today we always really Pleasure. appreciate thank your you. expertise So hopefully we'll join you again on February the 5th. Thank you very much for joining us here on episode 3 of the Getting Serious About Leisure podcast. <laughs>